So welcome, everyone. Uh, let's start breakout sessions of this KubeCon North America 24. Uh, I'm Alexander Kanievsky. Uh, I work for Intel, and I will today talk about a lot about the internals of the hardware, how it affects the workload, and vice versa. So even though I'm not going to show any particular performance number, but what you need to understand is what performance is think uh, relative and like there is no single solution which serves everyone. So be careful with all this like statements or understanding what, what I am saying. Um, I will be talking about Intel processors, but at the same time, I also will cover few things what is coming from our vendors. So like what is in, in modern ARM world, what is AMD is doing and so on. So all trade marks, all the copyrights are related to them. So first of all, uh, why I am speaking about that? Uh, I'm a hardware engineer by education, but all of my career I am working on the system software level. And currently I'm an Intel, uh, I'm principal engineer. Um, last six or so years, I'm working primarily on the things related to performance optimizations, platform enablement, um, power optimizations, and so on. So all of these things related to uh, like low-level things like runtime and Kubernetes stacks, um, all device enablement, device plugins, DRA, and so on, I'm more or less involved in all of those uh, in the past years. So I hope my experience is good enough to, to explain what is happening on the hardware level. Um, why I'm talking about that? The reason is primarily because the ecosystem of workloads, what we are running on top of our cloud, is changing rapidly. Uh, and most of the time, unfortunately, the CNCF ecosystem is not prepared to drastic change of workload patterns. So we knew what AI is coming. It was small models, it was usage of accelerators, usage on CPU, but when generative AI came, and we realized that what, whatever we have in device plugins was not enough, but this is how the DRA was born. Um, same happens actually in the CPU. It's not that e uh, easily visible. So every year, there are new technologies, there are new nuances what is coming. And, and again, unfortunately, CNCF system, uh, uh, ecosystem is not really prepared to be evolving as fast as the technology. So it's surprisingly, it now takes longer to create the software option for something when actually create the hardware for something. So the reason why I'm talking is mostly let's think about like how the CPUs and how uh, peripheral devices are changes. And let's think about how uh, user experience will be in the future. Let's be prepared this time for, for these challenges. So what to expect from this presentation? Like most of information what you have here or you will see today is based on my personal experience, based on open documentations, uh, well, my subjective interpretation of those. So some bits and especially for our vendors, it, it might be not entirely correct. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain in clean, world, uh, clean words uh, what to pay attention to, uh, how uh, different hardware components will affect your workload, how your workload will be affecting uh, the, the hardware, and so on. So I'm not going to give you exact solution. What I'm trying to do is try, I'm not giving you a fish, I'm trying to, you to, to teach how, how to fish. If you are interested in the hardware related topics, uh, I would highly recommend to also listen to uh, um, presentations what my colleagues from Intel, together with our colleagues from Google and NVIDIA have during this KubeCon. You might get a bit more uh, insights on exact hardware things or exact details of, for example, DRA. Um, just search in the uh, Intel, NVIDIA, Google, you most probably will find all the things which is related to the hardware. So, workloads. If you've seen today the keynote, 
there is a project called APIA, Open uh, Platform for Enterprise AI. And one of the examples of application, like the modern thing, like all the buzzwords, uh, AI, generative AI, is uh, about uh, retrieval augmented um, um, generation. So yes, you have a workload which consumes the accelerator. But what people mostly forgetting about is what you have a bunch of the smaller components inside, like the vector database, the smaller embedding model, and so on and so forth. All of those are running on standard like CPU and using the standard memory or using standard storage. And all of them have different characteristics, how we run and how we are consuming the hardware resources. To understand how and why, we need to get look in more details on each of those components independently. So CPU, IO, meaning like PCI buses and accelerators, and what happening on the memory. As I said, um, I wanted to talk about what is currently uh, on the market, so practically like last five years. I'm going to uh, reference in examples the last three generations of Intel CPUs. Uh, and as example also, I took the Graviton as classical ARM processor right now, and AMD Epic. So let's dive in. The core. So all of us knowing what, like for Kubernetes, I want X amount of CPU time, and I get a core or set of cores. So what is happening inside of the core? Inside you have few functional block. Like one, the first block is that uh, fetches the instructions, decodes them, and actually tells the processor what to do. And what to do is can be split into five functional blocks. So one block is load store. So it's practically how a CPU can, uh, communicates with external world to memory, to IO, through the caches, but the simple thing. Um, secondary is integer operations. So some uh, subtraction, multiply, division. All of those operations you are using in your software for like string processing, uh, iterating through arrays, everything. For more complex applications, you have floating point instructions. And again, depending on applications, you will be using different percent, uh, percentage of those. Newer pro processors also have instruction sets, which is uh, specifically for big data. Uh, vector and matrix. So why it's important to understand uh, what is happening here is because each of those instruction blocks we take different time how to process the instruction. And different applications have different uh, proportion of which instruction, instructions are executed. So if you have like web, normal web service applications, most of the time your workloads will be just utilizing the integer and uh, load store things. You start doing the cloud gaming, you will see the rise of usage of the floating point instructions. You start using machine learning, floating point instructions will be your majority. If you get the optimized libraries for machine learning, most of the time will be spent in vector and uh, matrix operations. Why it's important to understand that thing? Because it comes down to, to the next level. Again, most probably all of you know what, what technology is called hyper-trading, right? So what happens in, in that, uh, with hyper-trading on the hardware level? You have two front ends. Both of them trying to decode the instructions and place it in the execution queue uh, simultaneously. But if both threads are trying to execute the same type of instructions, the threads get interlocked. So one thread waits for an hour to finish. So if we are talking about uh, hundreds of, uh, of workloads running at the same time uh, on the machine, sometimes it's better to understand, like, are we hitting each other? Our way, or, or we can be using this thing um, uh, more efficiently. 
obvious solution for that. Like, forget about the hyper trading, let's, let's get more cores. Um, it works. Like, yes, we can do more cores nowadays. The technology is evolving. You get the separate front ends. You get the, um, uh, you get the independent operation units. You get caches and so on and so forth. The only problem is what uh, the space on which chip is limited. So we can bump amount of cores, but we, you will hit the bottleneck somewhere later in the stage. And uh, there are a couple of aspects for that. So uh, one aspect is what, like imagine you have a few dozens of a core, nice uh, mesh, you start to interconnect them uh, to get the data transferred. At some point, uh, this mesh uh, interconnect might be also not, not really efficient. So what happened uh, in past several years um, in ARM world and uh, on x86 inefficient cores, what people started to do is to group set of cores into a cluster. So yes, you have still independent compute units, but your cache may, might be uh, common for several uh, cores. And in Linux kernel terms, it's called cluster, cluster of CPU. Again, how it affects the workloads. You might uh, have workloads which is compute related, which uh, is more data transfer uh, intensive. So combining like two data intensive uh, application on the same cluster of a course might be not efficient. So you need to have a bit more granular thing uh, how to deal with it. Next thing, as I mentioned, so the more cores we are trying to put together, the more um, manufacturing problems people have to do it. So at some point, uh, pro processors were done in standard way. So like you have one single piece of silicon, on top of it the cores are printed, and then it gets connected to external world. At some point, you cannot put more cores into one physical space. So what people started to do is they created the idea of the chiplets or tiles or dice um, Different vendors call it differently. Uh, Linux kernel call it die, uh, but in overall the idea is simple. So you have independently uh, manufactured piece of silicon, which of them uh, interconnected with high-speed buses. So again, it's not always visible to the end application, but if you have HPC style application, very compute intensive, with small differences of few nanoseconds between like communication within one tile or versus communication between two tiles or in case of this generation of the one like it can be like two hops of the tiles it might be different so you need your application need to understand what if it's like so, such critical thing but technology is evolving um, already on the fifth generation of the, of the one uh, we were able to produce uh, fewer tiles, but more cores printed on it. So you still have the tiles, but you have like less differences between the cores. In sixth generation, it's gone even further. So you have like three tiles, you have more cores, and so on. On AMD world, it we gone a bit different way. So what we started to do is like we started to produce the small chiplets where the groups of eight to 16 cores are produced. We have common IO tile, which connects them all together. And uh, on my picture, it's just showing like four of them, just to know it over a lot. Um, but in general, it, it can be like up to 16 blocks of, of such tiles inside the one physical CPU. Again, um, because it's in, interconnected within one tile, uh, most probably you don't see the difference between uh, when you are communicating from one tile to another. For HPC application, you need to understand how many actually of those tiles present on the system. And unfortunately, it can be not so trivial because Linux kernel not always exposes that information. Um, so you might be vendor specific. A bit to the side. So uh, 
what else we've seen in the past years is uh, the rise of hybrid cores. It's not really um, very uh, often used on the server side, but it's used on the edge uh, scenarios where you have smaller nodes. Uh, you can see it in modern ARM processors from Apple. So you have a combination of a core, like so-called performance core and effective uh, core. Um, the big difference for between them is the speeds and sometimes organization of the caches. So here I can show, uh, I show you a picture of uh, well, Intel processor, which has a bunch of with performance core, with hyper-trading enabled, with uh, independent caches, and so on. Uh, plus it has two groups of uh, e-cores, which sharing the L2 cache. So if you have a workload running on the edge and you have different per uh, performance characteristics for those workloads, you might prefer one versus another in your definition. But that's not the only way of, we can call it like heterogeneous uh, CPUs inside one, uh, one socket. If you look at the modern server processors, you have hundreds of the cores, but what is uh, all possible to do on the hardware is to control frequencies of each individual core plus the interconnects between those, those cores. So what it, has, uh, what it allows us to do is actually to create different classes of the processors in, within the same system. You have high performance cores, like running on the uh, higher frequency, you have lower uh, frequency cores running uh, like not so critical workload. Why it's important? It helps to save uh, electricity and eventually money for you. So lowering part of uh, processors to, to lower speeds or actually forcing them to sleep actually allows the more performant processors to do the work faster. You do the same thing with less amount of time. So let's talk about IO. Classical processors, and this is something what is happening in most of the ARM world right now, right now, is what you have a group of cores, and on the sides of a chip, you have IO controllers, so like with PCI buses. All standard, all what we know, right? With chip-led designs, uh, amount of the controllers and way location has changed. So with four chip design, you can have like up to four different PCI controllers. Your devices might be um, connected to any of them. So you cannot say what like, hey, my socket, my network card connected to the socket. You need to be more granular saying like, well, it's actually connected to one of the PCI controller within that socket. Similarly to, to other things, like here, it's more simple. You have two of them. Uh, Communication actually between the core and to the PCI controller might be not uh, so critical, I mean, like from one tile to controller on another tile because the speed of the buses uh, between those uh, tiles are good enough so you don't really see the difference when you are talking to a PCI device. With uh, sixth generation of Xeon, similar scenario, so like you have bunch of core tiles, you have two controllers, the speed of the buses is big enough, so you don't see the difference from which tile you are communicating to which controller, and because they are all interconnected. With AMD, pretty much similar. So you have all the tiles connected to single controller, single IO die, the only bottleneck is what is inside of this IO die, how, how it's implemented. The speed of the devices. So we know what, like, PCI has several revisions, like PCI Express 4, 5, uh, 6, and so on. What, happening, uh, what happened in the past five years, a new protocol has been added. So it's called CXL, Compute Express Link. So this protocol is high speed, high bandwidth, uh, memory coherent um, protocol built on top of a physical and electrical uh, PCI Express. So it uses the same standard, uh, but the biggest difference what this protocol gives is like it, it introduces you uh, three more protocols on the logical level. 
So I/O similar to what was on PCI. So like interrupts, memory management, and so on, uh, like DMA transfers, controller registers, and so on, all of these things. But two new things, like one is cache, so the device might have a cache, and both CPU and device can have a cache coherency uh, to access the data. So you don't need any more pool data frequently. You, you, get, uh, you get the things uh, transparently updated. And the third thing is uh, CXL memory. And that allows us to do uh, like direct access from the CPU to the memory of the device. And memory of the device can be different. It can be volatile memory, it can be non-volatile memory. But it will be like just direct access. It. Based on that, CXL defines the three types of the devices. Uh, first device type is standard I.O. So it's like our usual NICs, nothing special here. The well, only difference is what, like, if a device implements the cache protocol, you, you need to pull it less. Second type of devices is practically the modern uh, accelerator devices. You have the uh, memory on, on the accelerator device. So how it's usually happening with workload, like you push a lot of data on it, accelerators start to process it on the device, you don't see the too much of the communications between the CPU and, uh, between CPU, between the local memory, be, be, between the remote memory. And type three of device is purely like memory extender devices. Again, it allows us to do direct access to memory located on external device. And that might be actually interesting and I will talk about that a bit later. So talking about the memory. First, let's agree about the terms because I've seen a lot of the times the terms NUMA get used and use it completely incorrectly. So first of all, NUMA, it's only about memory. It describes the zone of or group of memory which can be baked by different technology. You can have normal DRAM, you can have high bandwidth uh, memory, you can have CXL memory, persistent memory, and so on. Actually, even in that scenario, the thing uh, can be hidden by the hardware. So like the high bandwidth memory can be used as a, a, a additional cache to DRAM. Or like CXL memory can be used as a transparent extension of, of, of a DRAM. The term NUMA doesn't represent physical connectivity of, 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 the, of the things. It can, it can be close to what is physically, however, it's more like think about it as a, a mode of operation of a memory control, similar to RAID. Like you can have just a bunch of disks or you can have a stripe across the different things. So one takeaway. There is no CPU in NUMA, there is no PCI in NUMA. Those two things are separate entities. Don't mix them. How it's physically located? Uh, traditionally, it was very simple, like, and this is how the Kubernetes is built currently. So it assumes what you have a bunch of cores, you have PCI close to it, you have, uh, well, practically like one socket equal to one NUMA node. And for some processors, yes, it, it might work, for new, it doesn't. Reason, again, the tile design of a thing. So the fourth generation of Xeon, we have four memory controller, each of them uh, on each separate tile. We can all work as one single NUMA node and can be seen. Uh, we can do independently or we can do in pairs. So switching the different modes, you are trading the latency of access memory versus the bandwidth. You get one or an hour, depending on what kind of workloads you're interested in. Similarly to newer generations. So here we have either one NUMA node per socket or two NUMA nodes per socket. In sixth generation, one uh, NUMA node per socket, or uh, each tile has its independent memory controller, so it will be like three NUMA nodes per socket. On AMD, it's a bit interesting. So uh, memory controllers are integrated into uh, IO chip. And uh, again, like from physical point of view, it's one single NUMA node. 
In reality, most of the applications who are trying to be NUMA aware, we see like few hundreds of CPUs in one NUMA node and they break. So what, what people implemented is uh, similar to this uh, clustering mode. Uh, it's called nodes per, second, uh, per socket in AMD world. So we virtually split it. But here is the catch. So on AMD platform with NPS4, if not all the memory channels are populated, you might end up in the Linux kernel, the NUMA node, which has CPUs, because we split it according to the CPU tiles, but it has zero memory. And this breaks like everything in Kublet. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do with it. Um, so again, nuances. Um, TXL memory. I mentioned what this is a new type of devices. But uh, you might ask, is it really the thing? Is it really happening? Well, my answer is yes. So uh, where devices, what is available right now uh, from different hardware vendors, uh, they come in two usable form. Like one form is like a PCI card, which you just slice in into your server, and you can get extension of a memory. Uh, for example, like you have a server which uses like expensive DDR5 memory, and you can put extender, which uses more cheaper uh, DDR4 memory, you get uh, better uh, TCO number for your server. However, um, new things uh, which is coming, again, like this year, um, so, for example, like Samsung produces this, um, like you all get used to put the SSD through the front panel of a server, right? So the new standard EDSF, uh, it's similar for CXL type of interfaces. You can put the memory just like hot plug into the server. Uh, the form factor is similar, so like, it's, like it's either one unit high or three unit high um, models. The more interesting thing about the CXL memory is what uh, it also allows, the protocol allows us to do um, the rack level pooling. So imagine like you have rack of your servers, you have some device on top of it, which has like terabytes of memory on it. You have a controller, which you can say, hey, on my node, uh, a big workload is coming. I need more memory. Hop, and your memory get away, become available on, on your server. The well, interesting thing which CXL standards define about it is what you have this uh, management protocol which allows you to, uh, to attach and detach from memory. The security between hosts is enforced by a protocol, so no, no worries between that. So if, if you're not requesting uh, something from you, uh, from what is allocated for your host, you will not get access to another host. However, Protocol also provides an uh, interface to do the shared memory. So like things what is currently done with RDMA in the future potentially can be done with CXL thing. All right, so that, that was like hardware. A sneak peek what was happening in the last, let's say, five years on, on the hardware. Coming back to the workloads. As I mentioned, like in this particular example, you have different types of uh, pieces of the same workload which behaves differently. So document retrieval, it's mostly like strings crunch, crunching. If you start adding something like OCR uh, for document recognition, you will get more floating points. Embedding is a small uh, language models. Uh, it runs on the CPU, it's memory intensive, it's vector instruction in, in, in intensive applications. Uh, vector database, it's more like store, load, integer, uh, to some degree fluid in point operations or vector operations if, if we're using some of optimized routines. So each of those workloads, you must probably, you will not run like single instances of it. To scale, you need to run multiple of them. And you need to start em emphasizing like for this workload, these properties of the hardware might be important. Or I don't want to combine this piece of uh, software with that piece of software running on the thing. Uh, standard way uh, in Kubernetes, how it's done, let's create a bunch of nodes with different properties, and then let's spread those uh, workloads 
uh, with node affinity and anti-affinity between them. Um, it might be good, but we are talking like more and more where those things are running on the edge servers, or we just probably don't want to have like so much of a network communication between nodes because it also adds the latency. So we need to have ways how to express um, how these things are working together. Unfortunately, in Kubernetes, uh, we have a term pod QoS, and over the 10 years of, uh, of Kubernetes, we put a lot of assumptions what this term means and how we considering what we workload will be behaving. In my opinion, it starts to limit us. So we need to have a possibility to distinguish like what this container is about especially when we have like service uh, mesh containers or sidecars and so on. So you might have a main computation container which require guaranteed promises, but when like service mesh most probably is good as best effort and, and so on. And speaking about like the internals of Kublet, uh, uh, same thing, like we put a lot of things on top of this just three classes. And main things what deals with native resources inside Kublet are based on the assumptions which is like 10 years old. It's like in terms of warfare, it's like with spears and sword, you are fighting with a futuristic robot. It's not enough. We need to have more granular way to express what my workload will be doing and how we will be communicating between each other. And we cannot do it only for guaranteed QoS. We need to do it for all classes of the devices. But not all, not all bad. There are ways how to try it. So there is a thing called NRI, Node Resource Interface, which was introduced to uh, container D and Cryo. Um, it was experimental uh, for, for a while. This year, congratulations to the NRI team. Uh, it got enabled by default in container 2.0 release, which was released recently, and in the Cryo, which was released a bit. Uh, early this year. What it can do, like it allows you to write a plugin which can tune low level runtime parameters. And we are providing uh, as a community set of, uh, like, a set of uh, main community maintained plugins. Two of them I want to emphasize is uh, like the resource policy. One is mostly focused on the hardware. So all these topologies, what I described, it's automatically detected and tries to deal with it. Second one, with balloons, it's more focused on uh, application-specific application grouping, isolation between applications, and fine-tune uh, knobs for the workload. So for example, like you can tune the CPU speeds and so on. So if you have time, have a look at it. And my colleague Antje is going to talk about more in detail in his session. So takeaway, I want for you to uh, only three things. First, understand your hardware and software, how they affect each other. It will save you money and electricity. Second thing is we as a Kubernetes developers, we need to start thinking how the users will be able to express what is actually needed. And third thing, like over 10 years, we accumulated a lot of things. Our technical depth is huge and deprecating some of those components takes a time. So it feels like boil the ocean. And you know, everyone says like, we cannot boil the ocean. Well, I am from Finland. We have thousands of a lake. We cannot boil them all at the same time, but we can start with something small and so on. So, and that, thank you. I have one minute, I can answer questions. If not, we can talk afterwards in the corridors. <laughs> <laughs>